talk to Stephen in Kansas. Stephen, you're talking to hey, Eric and Matt. Uh, Eric. Hey. Hey, Eric and Matt. Uh, I just want to hey. let you know, Matt, I am a, I'm a huge fan of you. Oh, yeah, fine. And that's, that's cool. you pissed off is probably my favorite version of you. Well, turn into the beginning of the atheist experience because while I'm perfectly fine now, there will be a pissed off rant of epic proportions at the beginning of that show. Yeah, Matt, Matt is I will, intentionally... I will, I will try. He's intentionally being chill because that's the format of Talk Heathen, and uh, you're doing a good job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, All right, so... so you, you, I, I called last week. Yes, you did. And... Uh, yeah, and uh, you said you were going to talk to your went. pastor, right? Yeah, if he came down, uh, he did not. He was not able to make it. Okay, so we're not able to, you know, have that face to face, um, which is a little disappointing to me. But his uh, his wife's mom got sick, and she had to take care of him. And understandable. And one of his got kids got sick, so I under completely understood. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk, uh, actually, since both of you were on, it's actually great. Um, Something, I, I've been an atheist for, you know, like I said last week, for two years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, something I'm still trying to get over is this, the irrational fear of dying and going to hell. Yeah. Um, this is something Wh which I hell? deal with. It's not constant. Wh which hell? Uh, the, the Christian Christian hell. Why that one? Why aren't you worried about other ones? Uh, I guess it's probably because I was never raised in those uh, churches, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And and so that I get what I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying though, Matt. Is that you've never done this, so why are you worried about that? Yeah, my my thing was I know people who struggle with this, and I know people who who wake up from nightmares fifty years into being an atheist. But for me, it was really simple, and that is how much time have I spent worrying about some other religions, heaven or hell, and how do I know that those aren't worth more worry than mine? And so I went out and investigated. When I, you know, it's not like there's more evidence for Christianity than you know. Religion X, probably more than you know Scientology or Mormonism, but uh, it was it was very clear that this was just a lingering thing of indoctrination. And also the other th the other issue for me that made it easy is what the hell can I do about it? If there's some god that wants to squish me like a bug, I can't do anything about that. If there's somebody who wants to tor yeah. torture me forever after I'm dead, I can't do anything about that. But as long as my mind is mind, my <laughs> as long as my mind is mine then I can sit there in hell during the torture and know that I'm morally superior to the thug that's trying to beat me up. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's something that I, I still do have those thoughts, you know, of like, well, that, but then at the same time, why would, a, why would a God look at me and say, you know what, because you didn't, because you wanted evidence for me existing, I hate you. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, and yeah. so that's something gave, that really gave you a brain. Gave you a yeah. brain and planted you in a reality where the exercise of that brain is the absolute best way to understand reality and survive, and then made the single most important question completely immune to scientific inquiry and critical examination. And that, subject you to condemnation yeah, for that, doing so. That guy's a dick. Anybody yeah. that would set up a model yeah. like that, it, you are being set up to fail under that model. And, and that is accepting that the model is true. Even outside of accepting that that model is true, I, I think you've rationally come to the place where you recognize the harm in teaching that to people, the, the long-term consequences of it. The good news that I can tell you is that in the same way that, you know, I, I, we've had people who've called in, I don't know how many times you've watched Talk Heathen, but people have called in and said, hey, I still get comfort from praying even though I no longer believe. Is that somehow wrong? And when we've talked about it, it stops being spare, so effective, and you should replace it with something. And, and, the, right? and the other aspect of this whole thing about a brain and being stuck in reality mm -hmm. is the people who are advocating for this belief can provide no concrete evidence and are, are just bathed in logical fallacy after logical fallacy. We see it not just in calls to this show where I'm not expecting people to be an expert in, in even understanding their beliefs, let alone defending them, but look at the mainstream apologists. Look at the guys that I've debated. Look at the people who have these these huge platforms where they are the defenders of their faith. Ray Comfort's arguments and William Lane Craig's arguments are equally fallacious. It's just one of them is a little bit better at speaking than the other. And so what kind of, what kind of world is it where not only has God kind of set you up to fail, but all the people who are coming to tell you that, that I've found God, I've found God, I've found God, are demonstrably engaged in an irrational exercise that cannot possibly lead to the conclusion they've reached. I think Stephen agrees with you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do. So, yeah, so uh, in time, it can fade. 
and talking about it. You know, um, I, I strongly suggest everybody um, to get therapy. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. And I regularly go to a therapist. I have a, a meeting with my therapist tomorrow. And it, it's because I want to self-care. And especially when you've dealt with indoctrination, especially when you've dealt with uh, a lot of this crap, it helps to get help in the same way that you'd take your car to a mechanic. Yeah. Um, there's no reason why you shouldn't. Yeah, I'm not no diminishing the impact of it all. I'm just telling you what worked for me. Oh. Um, it's an yeah. undeniable thing. And I also know people who, not even within religion, have all sorts of irrational fears. I understand that it's not just an exercise. This, I just did a video on whether or not religion was mental illness. And I was pointing out that uh, the people who try to, to say this, when I asked them, okay, was I mentally ill when I was religious? They're reluctant to say that I was because that means that you can basically argue yourself out of mental illness. Uh, so it's an oversimplification. There are people with mental illnesses who are religious and who are non-religious. There are certainly people who, who you, you can argue that maybe the, the foundation for some religious beliefs began with particular mental illnesses. When you look at John of Patmos and, and the book of Revelation, that seems bizarre. None of this has anything to do with how absolutely uh, significantly impactful it can be to your life to be have irrational fears, whether they, they're the result of uh, mental illness conditions, mental health conditions, or whether they're the result of indoctrination, that doesn't change the fact that these things impact people's lives. And so I'm in agreement with Eric that uh, therapy, the Secular Therapist Project, is probably a very good place to start. Um, and also socializing with other people who've had to deal with similar issues um, and, and, and are probably still struggling with them. All those things can help. Stephen, also don't beat yourself up if you think that you should have gotten over it by now. Everybody's on their own, you know, on their own timeline yep. and it can take decades and decades for people to work through a thing. Um, I know that I personally felt guilty and upset because it seemed like everybody had moved through something and I rationally knew that, that it wasn't true, but it took me so long emotionally to move through that place. Um, don't do what I did. Learn from my mistake. You are absolutely entitled to your feelings you're absolutely entitled to take the time that you need to move through them. Um, you're on the right path, man. Um, you don't have to do it alone. Yeah. And your timeline is your timeline, so don't compare yourself to other people's because that's not fair to you. Yeah. And uh, right. what were you what you were saying about the... Uh, oh, sorry. Um, it's all right if I'm over my time. Oh, I, it was just getting a little loud in the background, so I wanted to make sure that we got to the last oh, caller. Yeah. But I do want to, you know, I don't want to cut you off in the mid-sentence. What did you want to say? Yeah. Um, what you were saying about timelines, that was uh, personal timelines. That's that's the kind of something I've still been going over. Like, because uh, I lost my mom when I was 20. Oh, um, dude, I'm sorry. Yeah, that sucks. Only like three years ago. Yeah, it was it was really tough, um, especially with how it happened. She had a, a lung aneurysm in the hospital. Oh. And... Uh, I was the one that had to tell them to stop doing CPR. And uh, I was there right front and center as they were doing it all. And I, my, I, I feel like my, a lot of my family, they've kind of moved on from it and they're done with their grieving process. There's still not days where I wake up, you know, crying my eyes out yeah. yep. uh, with grief. I, I feel guilty. But it shouldn't. That. Isn't it fucking tragic that it feels yeah. like the rest of the world has moved on and you're the only one still broken into pieces? Yeah, it's yeah. When, when you then, uh, like, when you made that decision, you didn't have any malicious intent. You loved no. your you loved your mom and wanted her life to end in peace, and that's absolutely nothing to ever feel guilty about. I know that that doesn't make the feelings go away, but if anything, I, I hope it helps a little bit because I, I understand that that can be an incredibly difficult decision. I wish we were doing a better job across the board about death with dignity and, and changing the laws that allow people to take control of their life and, and, the, and the end of life and dying process. Um, because I don't want people to feel guilty. I want people to make rational decisions, compassionate decisions, and then not have to suffer for years uh, because they were the one who had to make the decision. Yeah. Stephen? Uh, what made it worse was uh, just like a year later, I lost my dad as well. Oh, man. So we just woke up and found him uh, just deceased in the bed. Man, I, I'm, I'm very, that, so. very sorry to hear that. That's the only advice that I can give that I that I feel are comforting that I'd like to share is Stephen. 
your grief process is not ever going to take away the love that you felt for them. There's never going to come a time where you're going to stop loving them. And there's never going to come a time where it's going to stop hurting. When someone is that deep in your life, then it's never going to be the same. We don't, we don't hope to come back to a place where it is just as it was before. We find that new normal and we move forward with it. Yeah. But that hurt, that is, that is you loving them and that's okay. And you take as long as you need because that hurt's always going to be there. We just try and move forward day by day. When people die who we don't love, we don't hurt. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Hey, a lot of love coming from here, man. Um, yeah. Thank you, guys. Absolutely. You take care of yourself, okay, brother? Thanks, Steven. Huh? Thank you. See you guys.